Hi everyone, thank you for joining this recorded lecture on chapter eight. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to cover the empire of viruses. So what does that entail? Well, we're gonna talk about some mechanisms by which these non-living viruses reproduce. So more talk about um, virus sex. We talked about bacterial sex already. Uh, we're going to talk about the structure and appearance of viruses and then compare and contrast viruses viroids and prions and then we're going to finish up by talking about the role of viruses in disease transmission and we are living this life today as we speak so this is highly applicable to us the study of viruses is called virology and it began way back when in the late 1800s when there were some tobacco crops and they had acquired some sort of disease. And so microbiologists started studying that. And at first they thought it was from an extremely small type of bacteria. But then later on, a few years later, in the early 1900s, um, a Dutch microbiologist was the first to name these little particles uh, called viruses and virus comes from the Latin word for slimy liquid or poison and so my image here is a, a Google search for slimy liquid and this is what you get when you Google images for slimy liquid and that's what virus means and um, so um, here we are in the early 1900s, and uh, this Dutch microbiologist, Martinus Bejerink, was the first to identify these as something different from bacteria and call them viruses. Um, and then uh, it wouldn't be until the 1930s that we would actually be able to view these in a microscope, and that was when the electron microscope was invented. So some common types I'm sure you're familiar with are the viruses that cause the common cold and the flu, as well as AIDS, rotavirus, rabies, herpes, and polio. And of course, there's quite a few more. Let's talk about some characteristics. We already know that these particles are not alive. They're not living creatures. They're tiny particles that are made up of nucleic acids. The biggest virus is as big as the smallest bacterium. And they're surrounded by a protective capsule called a capsid. Now they can't replicate on their own. As we've discussed before, they hijack the host machinery and make it do its dirty work. And because of this, we call them obligate parasites. So how do we classify these obligate parasites? Well, we classify them by looking at not only the diseases that they cause, but how they replicate, what their shape is like, right? Their morphology, what genetic material they contain and the type of host that they invade. So what sets them apart from any other creature on this earth? Well, the first is, is that replication of viruses is not like any other creature on the planet. They actually, uh, viruses um, replicate by viral nucleic acid um, within the host cell. So they're basically just replicating their genetic material through viral replication. The nucleic acid is either RNA or DNA, okay? They never have both. They only have one or the other, and that can appear as a single strand, a double strand, a linear strand, or a circular strand of RNA or DNA. Now, RNA viruses are special viruses called retroviruses. And an example of a retrovirus is the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. They also do not produce any ability to create their own energy, and they depend on the host cell for that. 
Also, scientists haven't been able to find any fossilized viruses, so it's hard to know where they come from, but they have some theories, or let's say guesses. A couple of the guesses, one is that they were independent life forms in the beginning, maybe prokaryotes, very simple little creatures, um, and they combined with other cells and they gave up all of their properties of independence. They became codependent. Okay, that's one guess. The other guess is, is that they were once some sort of functional organelle uh, in another type of microbe, let's say, that went on the lamb and broke away and just kind of tried to exist on its own um, and found out that it couldn't, right? And so it developed the ability to join with other cells and inject its uh, genetic material inside of it, okay? So those are the basic distinguishable characteristics, the theories, the, character the, um, the way that we classify them, um, and uh, part of that, um, morphology is that there can be a variety of structural designs. They can be um, icosahedral, which is a 20-sided geometrical shape. They can be helical, or they can be something else. All right, there is a type of viral particle called a viron, and these virons have something called a nucleocapsid, and it's surrounded by uh, an outer layer, which is made of lipids, and the, the viron actually borrows this from the cell membrane of the host, which just blows my mind. Um, and then this is how viral proteins attach and or are inserted into other cells. And this lipid bilayer is referred to as an envelope. All right, so let's um, take this information about viruses and apply it to the COVID-19 virus. Now the COVID-19 virus is a retrovirus. So it is a rare type of virus that is constructed only of a linear strand, a single linear strand of RNA. Now, it also has that envelope that we were just talking about. It's a very rigid envelope that also helps to aid in its protection and allows it to bind to other cells. Our cells, those dirty little creatures, um, and their structural design you can see here is spherical. And they have these little suction copies on them and uh, these are proteins, these little protein spikes. And these spikes allow them to uh, further bind to other cells. Now it's the largest RNA virus, the largest retrovirus that has ever been discovered. And its size is 125 nanometers in diameter. And remember when we talked about kilobases um, and, you know, that is uh, a thousand bases, the COVID genome it, it is really big. It has 27 to 34 kilobases, kilobases. So that's a lot for a virus. Um, so this nucleocapsid that it has, like I said, helps it with binding. And what we mean is binding at a receptor site with another cell so that it can secrete this membrane that, that or um, enzyme that cleaves the membrane of the host cell and allows it to insert its genetic material into there. And you can kind of see that process in this other image that I've inserted on the top right. So once it does deposit its genetic information um, once it gets inside, then the replication process begins. And this process begins in the cytoplasm near the nucleus of the host cell. Then once it has replicated itself, then that copy is going to exit via secretory vesicles that pinch off from the Golgi apparatus and export it outside of the cell in that process called exocytosis. Viruses infect us 
by four main ways. One is inhalation of respiratory droplets, two, exchange of bodily fluids, three, ingesting of contaminated food or water, and three, bites from arthropod vectors. So let's talk just a minute about the process of infection. The book uses the example of the rhinovirus, which is going to be super, super similar to the coronavirus. Um, they are both transferred via drop, respiratory droplets or aerosol droplets. So um, let's say that there is an individual that is infected and they sneeze and that sneeze is going to send viral particles in the air in those droplets. Now somebody nearby takes a breath in at the same time and those viral particles are going to go into the nose and they're going to bind there and once they do they are going to invade the host cells there and begin replicating. Once they have replicated so much that they are literally busting the walls of the host cell, the host cell is going to burst. And those viruses, um, those viral particles are going to go skipping about, okay? And then they can, in then invade other cells of the host. And these are going to get carried down into the airway of the lungs. They're gonna implant into the cells along the nasal pharynx and the bronchial tree. And this is going to stimulate the inflammatory process of our immune system. And this is going to cause all of those things that we've talked about before with the immune response, it's gonna cause inflammation and the body is going to send its army to start fighting off this invader. Um, that's also um, going to cause it with the rhinovirus and coronavirus as well, that's going to cause um, uh, an increase in body temperature and that increase in body temperature is hopefully going to slow down the replication process of the virus. Now using antibiotics to treat viruses is not very effective and so um, you know viruses are very difficult to treat because they do invade our own cells so we literally have to kill off our own cells to kill them. We have covered the topics of lysogenic and lytic cycles in previous chapters, but so this would just be a quick review and a reminder that some viruses like herpes simplex or HIV don't reproduce right away. So once they infect the host cell, they just begin incorporating their genetic material and their instructions for replication into the host cell, but they don't reproduce. And as those host cells reproduce, they reproduce with that, those um, viral genetic instructions. And then nothing really happens until there's a change in the environment that causes them to react. All right, and um, so some uh, an example of that could be um, some sort of environmental situation, like I said, or predetermined genetic signal, and then that's gonna then that's referred to as the lysogenic stage. And then once there's some sort of signal, then they're going to go to work and begin rapid replication, and that is referred to. Um, as the um, the lytic cycle. And so then the genetic uh, material of the virus is going to um, allow it to create virons and these virons are going to release the genetic instructions and they're going to begin constructing these new viral particles. And then the host cell is going to break or burst or lyse, therefore we get the name lytic um, cycle. Okay, so, um, and then we also discussed bacteriophages, how those are little uh, viruses that invade bacteria. 
Suffice it to say that, you know, at first scientists were kind of working to see if these bacterial phages could help us, but with the discovery of antibiotics that kind of fell to the wayside, with all of these resistant strains of bacteria, we're kind of coming back and revisiting how we can use these bacteriophages to our favor. Um, an example of one way is um, they have uh, designed nasal sprays that can secrete specialized enzymes that are capable of causing destruction of pathogenic bacteria without causing any harm to the host cell. They're also looking at creating bacteriophages that can penetrate those walls created by biofilms. So those are a couple ways. Um, and then lastly, on this slide, I just want to talk a little bit about latent viral infections. So a good example of this is the, um, the herpes zoster virus um, that is a latent virus of varicella or chickenpox. So chickenpox can become dormant and enter the nerve cells after that initial infection from the blood. So they leave the blood, they enter the nerve cells, and they just kind of hang out there. And when there's a change uh, in the environment of the body, this can awaken them. And a good example is stress. Stress can awaken them. Some, something that happens that lowers the um, individual's immune system and then the virus reacts and it causes this painful condition uh, called shingles. Uh, the cytomegalovirus is another one that's extremely common and a majority of us have it by the age of 40 and normally we don't know that we have it and it's dormant and it lies undetected. But if there is a situation where an individual becomes immunocompromised, either they've become infected by HIV or they've had some sort of transplant, so they are on an immunosuppressive drug, then that can uh, activate the cyto cyto um, megalovirus, and then it can begin to replicate and cause symptoms. Because viruses don't carry out their own biochemical reactions and they use the processes that are already there in the host cells, antibiotics have no effects on them. The way that an antibiotic works on bacteria is either by inhibiting new genetic instructions or interfering with the construction of the new cell walls. And since viruses don't do that, again, they don't have any effect. So at first, the, the main focus was on prevention. And immunizations work because they cause the body to produce those antibodies to the antigens that the virus gives off. So, um, so then immunizations are effective. However, um, you know, as well as I know, that it is suggested that we get a flu vaccine every year. And the reason for that is because viruses replicate so quickly, it's easy for them to make a mistake. And when they make these mistakes, that alters the virus slightly. So that means last year's virus might, or last year's vaccine, might not be effective on this year's strain. Um, another misnomer is that some people think that only children need to be vaccinated, but adults need to be vaccinated too. And sometimes adults need concurrent vaccinations or boosters. Um, and so the book lists numerous reasons for children and adults to maintain their vaccination status. And first and foremost is protection right? Protection against those people that aren't getting vaccinated and they have something that we could protect ourselves against, right? Other reasons is that um, in the, the shingles um, vaccine is a good example of how some viruses lay dormant in the body and then when there is a, a special um, occasion like um, uh, the immune system is compromised, then that virus can turn on. So those vaccinations are good. Also, if we're gonna be 
uh, traveling to a different country. I mentioned the annual flu shot because of the, the change, uh, the mutation in the strain. Also, there might not have been um, a vaccine that was as effective when you were a child, but now that you're an adult, there's one that's more effective. So getting a booster because of that is a good idea. Also, that vaccine may not have been available. For example, the human papillomavirus vaccine or HPV vaccine. In addition, if um, you're living in close proximity with someone, say college students in a dorm, then they might require that they get vaccinated against bacterial meningitis. And healthcare workers, right? We know this. As healthcare workers, we're required to um, get certain vaccinations and keep up and be current on those vaccinations. And some of those we've already talked about before, like Hep B, influenza, MMR, varicella, Tdap, and uh, sometimes meningococcal. And then those that are involved in sexually active relationships should also be vaccinated to protect themselves and also to protect their partners. Interferons are special glycoproteins and their job is to interrupt replication of either the RNA or the DNA viruses. And so they're produced by the host cells. Once they're infected, the cell knows and it releases an interferon and this interferon becomes like this big flashing neon sign on the surface of the cell and that alerts the immune system to um, to attack it it also shuts down the replication of the viruses it may result in the death of that host cell but it also stops the virus from replicating there's two different types of interferons in humans. Uh, type 1 is produced by the leukocytes and fibroblasts, and type 2 is produced by the lymphocytes during an immune response. Natural killer cells are a good example of these, and they're uniquely energized by interferons. And so these interferons are going to play a big role in regulating the immune system. Because of that, they also have certain anti-cancer properties um, with ongoing research in those areas. Herpes viruses, gastrointestinal viruses, and enteroviruses are among the most common viruses that infect humans. Now the herpes virus, the text talks about herpes simplex, varicella zoster, cytomegalovirus, and Epstein-Barr virus, and human herpes virus 6 and 7. Now, Herpes virus infections are very common among the animal population, and that includes us. Um, the name herpes comes from the Greek word herpain, meaning to creep, signifying their chronic reoccurring conditions and their ability to lay dormant in the neurons. And then when the time is right, immunocompromised situation or stress, that it can become reactivated. There are about 100 strains that have been identified, but only eight of those are um, human strains of herpes viruses. And so the herpes simplex virus, it's typically caused through breaks in the skin or mucous membranes or direct contact with lesions as well as intimate contact such as kissing or sexual intercourse. Um, there is HSV1 and HSV2. HSV1 typically occurring in and around the, the genital area and then HSV2 occurring in the mouth or around the mouth area. It, um, like I said, it can lay dormant for a long time as a plasmid 
And then when there's an immunocompromised situation or some sort of uh, stress, it can be brought on by stress, then reactivation re can occur. This is the same with varicella zoster virus, which is what gives us chickenpox. Again, it can lay dormant um, after the whole chickenpox thing. And then um, years later, in the, the later adult years, can resurface. And the best way to treat it is by getting that shingles vaccine. Um, another herpes virus is cytomegalovirus, which we talked about a little bit before. Um, typically, um, it is uh, easily spread from the um, pregnant mom to the fetus and it's responsible for birth defects such as um, vision, hearing loss, seizures, and cerebral palsy occurring in about one in 150 births. The transmission usually occurs through close contact with uh, saliva secretions or blood or blood transfusions, and it closely resembles infectious mononucleosis, which is the kissing disease. Epstein-Barr virus is responsible for causing that infectious mononucleosis, and there is also a link to some nasopharyngeal cancers as well due to the, the Epstein-Barr virus. It's acquired through close contact, again, through exchange of saliva, similar to the other herpes uh, viruses. It can lead to um, lymphadenopathy, fever, malaise, uh, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, and um, the individuals need to be closely watched if their spleens are getting bigger or their livers are getting bigger because this could eventually lead to a rupture. So sometimes um, while there's no specific treatment for it, sometimes physicians will treat uh, the inflammation with steroids. And then there's the herpes 6 and 7, which is pretty closely related, although we can't prove that herpes um, uh, 7 has any um, harmful um, um, implications for humans. Herpes virus 6 um, has been directly linked with something called roseola and phantom in infants, which causes like fever and rash. Now, gastrointestinal viruses, some common ones are rotavirus and norovirus, and then astroviruses. And so there's two different types. There's enteropathogenic diseases, which actually cause symptoms within the GI tract. And then there's others that enter through the GI tract, but they cause issues somewhere else besides the GI tract. Those are referred to as enteroviruses. So gastrointestinal viruses like the, um, the rotavirus um, causes uh, infections in very young children. And uh, there have been two vaccines that were developed for infants the norovirus is a single-stranded RNA virus, and it's responsible for acute gastroenteritis infections, was once referred to as the winter vomiting disease or the Norwalk-like virus, and a lot of us refer to it as the quote-unquote stomach flu. But it's the most common cause of acute gastroenteritis and foodborne disease outbreaks in the United States. And then the astrovirus, which is called this because of its star-like shape of the virus um, and is responsible for some GI issues, but not as acute as the uh, caused by the norovirus. And then the enteroviruses. Enteroviruses are RNA viruses and they include the rhinoviruses, polioviruses, Coxsackie viruses, and echoviruses. Um, there's also several strains of pathogenic non-polio enteroviruses as well. So the rhinovirus is probably pretty familiar. That's the one that causes the common cold. And uh, this is uh, spread through aerosol spray, 
you know, runny nose, stuffy head, cough, fever, those kinds of things. No vaccines, no cure. We wash our hands. That's the best way to prevent the spread of the rhinovirus. Polio virus is usually transmitted by the fecal oral route and it chooses to multiply in the mucosa of the gut, although it enters typically through the mouth. It will colonize in the nose and throat and then make its way into the stomach. Um, most infections are asymptomatic, but when we have an immunocompromised situation, pregnancy, steroid use, so on and so forth, then it can spread into the central nervous system and can cause permanent paralysis and uh, damage the spinal cord. And we've pretty much gotten rid of poliovirus here in the United States, but it still is an issue in uh, developing countries. The Coxsackie virus is, uh, you might have heard of hand, foot, and mouth disease, which causes um, these lesions in the mouth and on the hands and on the feet. Um, a, a kids are susceptible to this in daycare, and it's primarily spread through the fecal oral route as well. Uh, the echo virus is a small virus, and it's composed of protein and a single-stranded RNA, and this can um, cause infections within the first two weeks of life, and that can lead to severe disease and mortality. It's um, uh, most common cause of aseptic meningitis in infants and accounts for about 20% of all documented cases of viral encephalitis. It can also cause a syndrome of acute motor weakness and paralysis that is indistinguishable from poliomyelitis. And then those non-polio viruses, um, typically transmitted through the fecal oral route, some through um, aerosol droplets, but most infections are asymptomatic. Some can cause some flu-like symptoms. Respiratory viruses, hepatitis viruses, and the human immunodeficiency viruses are also common viruses associated with humans. There are approximately 200 viruses that infect the respiratory system, but only a few cause major respiratory diseases, and those are the paramyxoviridae virus, the influenza virus, parainfluenza, um, the um, syncytial virus, or RSV, human metanumovirus, and coronavirus. So the paramyxoviridae um, are important pathogens in children. They cause a large number of respiratory diseases, including laryngotracheobronchitis, or the croup, bronchiolitis, and pneumonitis also cause mumps and measles. Now the human parainfluenza virus, which is a respiratory virus, is typical for causing acute lower respiratory tract infections in infants. And then the respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, if you remember RSV season, um, it causes uh, most respiratory infections in infants. It also causes pneumonia and bronchitis. And we have epidemics yearly uh, occurring around the world um, for RSV. Currently, there's no vaccinations against it, but there are some inhalation treatments um, with ribavirin that can be used to um, help fight against the um, virus. Um, now, adenoviruses are also respiratory viruses, and they're responsible for causing pharyngitis, acute respiratory disease, pneumonia, pharyngoconjunctival fever, and viral con conjunctivitis, which is pink eye. Also responsible for genitourinary infections and gastroenteritis typically transferred via the fecal route, direct contact, or respiratory aerosol droplets. Um, 
typically these guys don't give us too much trouble unless there's some sort of um, immunocompromised situation. And then that brings us to the coronavirus. Uh, six uh, types of coronaviruses that infect us, and they are uh, distinguished by that crown of spikes that's on the surface that allows it to adhere to host cells. The book lists SARS, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and MERS, Middle East Respiratory Synd Syndrome, um, as two of the most common ones. Uh, we know that there has been um, a change in that since 2020, and now we have that COVID-19 on the list as well. Influenza, that's our flu. Uh, influenza viruses are divided into three types, A, B, and C, and the types A and B are the ones that cause seasonal outbreaks. Type C only causes mild uh, respiratory symptoms, um, and is not really believed to be a cause of epidemic outbreaks. However, it does change frequently, and because of this, that's why we need to get um, an annual vaccine. Uh, examples of flus that were really devastating was the Spanish flu, which killed 25 to 50 million people worldwide. 700,000 Americans uh, died um, because of the Spanish flu. And uh, the World Health Organization has a special way of naming these flus. And um, anyways, they have a couple examples there, but they're looking at the antigenic type, the type of host, uh, the geographic origin of the, the strain, the strain number, the year that it was isolated, and some various other components. Um, but these viruses cause our quote-unquote flu-like symptoms of fever, cough, muscle aches, chills, so on and so forth. Um, the hepatitis viruses are going to be the ones that cause inflammation of the liver. And there's about 20 of those, but the book's o book only covers a handful of those, four or five of those. And... Um, all of them are going to impact the liver and cause jaundice, which is a yellowing um, of the skin and eyes, fever, weakness, and flu-like symptoms. Hepatitis A is typically transferred from the fecal oral route, um, but it can also be found in semen and blood. But a lot of times, um, this is what you're going to get from eating infected food at a restaurant, is hepatitis A. Hepatitis B um, is acquired parenterally, so typically blood transfusions and contaminated needles and or sexually. Again, it's going to cause those same types of symptoms. It can also lead to permanent damage of the liver called cirrhosis. Uh, there is a vaccine for hepatitis V, uh, hepatitis B virus and um, it is a three injection series and um, it's pretty much required for all of us working in healthcare. Hepatitis C is known, it was known as non-A, non-B hepatitis, uh, but now we refer to it as hepatitis C. It's uh, also transmitted parenterally and sexually like hepatitis B virus and um, there is um, uh, an acute type and a chronic type. So acute, the infection is going to develop uh, um, six to ten weeks after exposure and produce flu-like symptoms, where chronic um, hepatitis C virus incurs, it occurs in 50 to 60 percent of the cases, and most carriers remain contagious for the rest of their lives. The hepatitis D virus uh, also called the Delta virus, um, only infects those liver cells that already have a hepatitis B vaccine uh, virus. So if you've had the hepatitis B vaccine, then you're also going to be protected from the hepatitis D virus. And then the last one is hepatitis E virus, which is similar to hepatitis A virus that's transmitted through the fecal to oral route and um, 
cause acute but not chronic infection. And it's believed to be the primary causative agent for hepatitis in developing countries with poor or marginal sanitation or uh, contaminated drinking water. And lastly, HIV. HIV um, was isolated um, in 1983 and found to be the cause of the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS. Um, transmission routes are through blood, sexual contact, and mother to child. It was believed that this virus came from African apes um, as simian immunodeficiency virus, and then it likely jumped species when the animals were eaten for food. Um, there are treatments for HIV and AIDS. Um, there have been huge breakthroughs in antiretroviral drugs that have really helped us to treat um, and uh, control the progression of HIV. And currently there's 30 approved effective drugs that are used to treat um, HIV and also maintain those T lymphocyte counts so that we keep that immune system functioning as well as possible. Viroids are prominently responsible for causing mutations in plants or diseases in plants. And uh, in the early 1900s, some farmers noticed that they had some potato crops that were being deformed by some sort of unknown pathogen. And uh, several years later in 1970, there was a plant biologist and he was the one who discovered what they, uh, uh, credited with deforming these potatoes, and that was the viroid. And they call it the potato spindle tuber viroid. And since then, there's been about 30 other species of these viroids that have been identified, and the scientists expect that there are a lot more. But right now, we only know of ones that uh, infect different types of plant crops. And uh, they're basically these little naked loops of RNA, and they're very small. They're one eighth the size of a normal virus, and they have about 400 nucleotides. Uh, to put that into perspective, the flu virus has about 14,000 nucleotides. And um, what this little guy does is he tricks the cell, the host cell, into making new copies of the, the RNA strand. And um, so the scientists believe that viroids may represent prehistoric ancestors of modern viruses, um, but it is pretty interesting that they continue to exist and thrive in today's modern world. We have talked about prions in previous lectures and how prions are these proteinaceous particles. They do not contain any genetic information and that's why it's really difficult for us to kill them. They attack the brain tissue and uh, not only in animals, but in humans as well. And um, the uh, they're referred to, the diseases that they cause are referred to as transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. And what happens is these proteinaceous particles, they sit um, on the tissue, they lie on the tissue of the brain and spinal cord, and they destroy the tissue and literally create holes in it. And that gives it the appearance of a sponge. And that's why they call it spongiform. That's how it gets its name. So the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, they now believe that the same prion that causes mad cow disease causes the Crutchfeld-Jakobs disease in humans.
And uh, this is a disease of the brain that is eventually fatal. It has symptoms similar to dementia and Alzheimer's. It does have a really long incubation time. Uh, and there are a couple different types that the book talks about. One is gerstmann strassler Scheinker syndrome. And there's only a few families in the world that have been found to have this syndrome. And it is an inherited disease and it has similar symptoms, um, dementia and ataxia. It typically manifests itself between, in the individual between the years of 35 and 55, and there is no cure uh, for this form of prion infection, and the treatment is geared towards alleviating symptoms similar with all the rest. The second one that the book talks about is fatal familial familial insomnia, or FFI, which is also very rare. It's also an autosomal dominant inherited disease, and they think it can be caused by a mutation in the prion protein. And uh, patients present with symptoms of increasing insomnia, which progresses to death within approximately nine months with no treatment and no cure. And then lastly, Kuru disease was, uh, became an epidemic in the 1950s in New Guinea. And there was a tribe called the Four Tribe, and they had this cultural custom where when an individual of their tribe died, they were to consume the body, including the brain, of that individual as a sign of respect and remembrance for that person. Uh, and this is how they were transmitting this disease. Um, so the government said, hey, you have to stop doing this practice um, because it is transmitting this transmissible spongiform encephalopathy um, and they ceased doing that and that eradicated the disease. So this brings us to the end of chapter eight and our discussion about viruses. I hope that it was helpful. I hope that you found some parts of it at least interesting and I hope that you're one step closer to falling in love with microbiology.